So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, it's really a pleasure to invite you to the first um, director's lecture series for the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have Professor Tuli Madansela at SOAS. Tuli, it's lovely having you here. Uh, with, of course, Vim de Villiers, who's the vice chancellor of the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, my name is Adam Habib. And I am the director of SOAS, University of London. Um, before we uh, begin tonight's event, I want to uh, remind you that we're in a fairly somber moment uh, in this nation at this moment. I know that we often are uh, quite a robust place that is the recipient of fairly robust debate, as it should be. Uh, but tonight, there has somebody who has been passed on, uh, the sovereign of uh, this nation, but also a human being who's passed on. And I think it's important that from whatever ideological vantage point we come, we reflect a human empathy. And from that principle of human empathy, I think I would like to ask you to just observe a minute silence uh, for the family and uh, the government and the people of this nation. Thank you. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the director's series. Uh, about a year ago, we at SOAS launched what we call the director's lecture series. And really, it's been targeted to deliberate on the big questions of our time. There are complex issues around identity, around memorials, around inequality, around democracy, around populism that plague our world and is a manifestation across national boundaries. And we felt that we want to bring people here who don't normally get a voice, uh, but to ask provo provocative questions and to try and think through difficult questions of this historical moment. So our first lecture, for instance, our first deliberation, was on vaccine equity in the middle of our uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we asked the question, why aren't we distributing vaccines more equitably around the world and the consequences thereof? We had debates around reparations. And we had difficult issues that do not get a sufficient hearing in our world. Uh, we make sure that those issues receive some deliberation uh, uh, through the director's lecture series. The director's lecture series is, we hope, a blended event. Until very recently, it was mainly an online event, but we hope increasingly to move towards an, a blended event. There are a number of people here who are online, uh, and of course, many uh, in the hall itself. And today, as I said, is the first of this lecture series for the 2022-2023 academic year. And I don't think we could have a better person than Tuli Madansela, a fierce advocate of human rights, a fiat advocate of holding states accountable. Tuli Madansela uh, is the Lord Trust Chair in Social Justice in Stellenbosch University. But she is truly the former public protector in South Africa. And any of you who have any understanding of South Africa will, will know that South Africa is in the middle of unraveling what we've come to call state capture. The initial report that enabled that unraveling of state capture emerged from Tulima Donsela and her team, as she reminded me, uh, in the public protector's office many, many years ago. And she did so in the context of huge threats against her, huge threats to a person, huge threats to a right to occupy an office. And she withstood those threats. 
she stood there, she uh, provided, if you like, incredible evidence that when principal leaders stand up for conviction, that they can fundamentally change the possibilities uh, of an administration and particularly of a society. And so I think South Africans uh, uh, owe a particular debt uh, to, to Lima Dancela, uh, who moved on from that position uh, to play uh, a, a particularly important role in launching uh, the Tuma Foundation for Democracy, Leadership and Literacy. Uh, she is a member of the African Academy of Sciences. And as I said, she plays an important role as Law Trust Chair uh, in Social Justice at Stellenbosch University. Um, I want to stop there. This is not a lecture for me. It's really we're here to listen to Tuli Madonsela. And I want to invite uh, Vim de Villiers, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Stellenbosch, um, to take this moment uh, to introduce uh, one of his senior professors, Vim de Villiers. Thank you very much, Adam. So good evening, everyone. So I'm Wim de Villiers. I'm the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of Stellenbosch University. I want to thank you uh, and also SOAS for the invitation tonight. And it's really truly a pleasure to be here to represent Stellenbosch University and to strengthen our partnerships and to deepen the collaborations between the two institutions. So it is a pleasure to uh, introduce a phenomenal person, a terrific colleague at Stellenbosch University, Professor Tuli Madonsela. She actually needs very little introduction, but I want to highlight a few aspects of her very impressive CV. And that is, in 2014, Time magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And in 2016, she was Forbes Africa's Person of the Year. And that's also the year in which her non-renewable seven-year term as South Africa's public protector came to an end. Uh, of all her achievements, it was surely that role as public protector that most put her in the public eye, especially in South Africa. During her tenure as public protector, she investigated several high-profile cases, including at least two implicating our former president. But more importantly, she also came to the aid of thousands of ordinary South Africans who had turned to her to protect them from abuses by the state. Now, she may be soft-spoken, but she is a fearless fighter for ethics and good governance. She was born in Soweto, obtained a Bachelor of Law from what is now the University of Isortini, and an LLB from Witz University in Johannesburg. And then her first job, actually, was as an assistant teacher at her former high school. Later, as an advocate of the High Court of South Africa, she would become a lifelong activist for human rights and the rule of law. She was an active participant in the anti-apartheid struggle and would also be one of the drafters of South Africa's new constitution after 1994. As a daughter, sister, and mother, she is a strong proponent of gender equality. She is a member of the South African Women Lawyers Association and the Business Women's Association of South Africa, and has written extensively on the advancement of women. I'm very proud that she joined Stellenbosch University at the start of 2018 as the law faculty Trust Chair in Social Justice. She has not only been helping us in building a community of shared values, uh, she launched the annual Social Justice Summit. She puts her body on the line. She summited Kilimanjaro whilst um, raising funds for students in need. Uh, she spearheaded an annual Freedom Walk which uh, I also participated in on June the 16th this year uh, from the center of Stellenbosch to one of the outlying communities, a, a solid slog of 16 Ks, and I really had to struggle to keep up. So, but that's who she is. So it's really a pleasure to give you Tuli Madonsela.
thank you, Prof. Thim Tavilius, and for, for that very kind introduction, and thank you to Prof. Habib in this community for the privilege to be here. The only other place I know where the senior introduces the junior is at One Young World. So the reason I'm here is because I was attending One Young World, and our job is to support young people, like most people in this room, who are solving the problems of this world and showing us how it's done, what impact they've already made, and how can we support them. And our job as counselors is to introduce them like rock stars. So somehow, like the young people at One Young World, I get to have my boss introduce me like a rock star. <laughs> so thank you, Prof. That's quite humbling. And pr thank you, Prof. Uh, Adam Habib, two men that I admire a lot. And of course, because they had to talk about me as presenting this lecture, they forgot to mention that both of them have been crusading for social justice without me, and more recently with me uh, for many years. And, and therefore, it is a huge privilege and honor to talk to you today about the meaning of social justice as part of a conversation on building bridges of hope. I chose this idea of the meaning of social justice and linking it to building bridges of hope because when I think back to the times of um, Jane Austen in this part of this world, I think about the time of um, James Somerset in this part of this world, Charlotte McCoy in our part of this world, or of the world, Olive Schreiner, Pixley Gasseme, and everyone. There's nothing in this world that could convince me to go back in time and live during their time. So things are sometimes bad in our time and they're not as good as they could be. But I genuinely think that we thank those who went before us and did something to convince people to embrace the humanity of everyone. And I believe that they did that by building bridges of hope. For example, if you think about why I'm able to practice law today, Women tried to fight on their own. Una Wuki, who saved articles under Gandhi and passed with sterling colors, was blocked by the Law Society when she was supposed to be admitted. The High Court accepted, and the matter went to the appellate division. She lost because colleagues thought women should not practice law for various reasons, including our temperament, which if you talk about people who explode in the room when they're angry, <laughs> in your lifetime, whether it's at home or out there, it's not people like Justice Kate O'Regan, yeah? but she would have been told during Una Wookie's time that she's not fit to practice law. The other reason, apart from temperament, they also said we do not have modesty. And what was held against women lawyers was the fact that a certain caffeinia in Roman times was annoyed by the judge that wouldn't listen to her, and she turned, she turned around and flushed the judge. So it became the caffeinian curse. But... Other people 
have smashed other people's faces with their fists, and it was never said they should not practice. So I'm just saying that the reason we're here is because those before us saw something beyond what their peers could see. And they thought that a better world was possible. And they started putting ideas to society <coughs> to help them transition to the other side. So I come from a part of this world that is seen as a magical transition from a cursed society built on an extractive structure of colonialism, apartheid, patriarchy, heteronormalcy, and everything that excludes other people, where people with disabilities would be hidden by families because they were seen as a curse. But that society had people who saw a better future and they left us with a constitution that embraces the humanity of everyone. So unlike Somerset in Stuart versus Somerset, we can speak for ourselves. If you think about that case, if it hadn't been for the fact that he had godparents, he's a grown up, he had godparents, and to save himself, to be saved from slavery, the godparents had to apply to a court to stop Stuart from sending him back to Jamaica into slavery. Again, it took a judge who understood that for law to be upheld, for everyone to respect the rule of law, the law had to be just, or the law had to be interpreted justly. And he is even reputedly as having said, let justice prevail even if the heavens may fall. That was the Chief Justice, Lord Mansfield. So that's why I think if we're going to discuss social justice, I invite you to join me in discussing the topic within the context of breaches of hope. Because it might, we might not be where we want to be, but today is better than yesterday. And if we build those breaches of hope, that some of the people on, on the shoulders of whom we stand build, we can build another breach for the next generation. For example, I have legal equality with everyone because somebody made that possible. I have a claim to human rights because somebody made it possible. I have a right to vote because somebody made it possible. So if I was in the same situation as Charlotte McCoyge and all of these other people I've mentioned, I would still have just to struggle to get a voice. As Nancy Fraser says, a proper democracy must give everyone a voice. And so what is social justice? Perhaps we should start there. I am fascinated that most of the papers that I've read about social justice start with this line. There is no common definition of social justice. And then they go on and define it. Sometimes they define it as affirmative action. Sometimes they define it as um, socioeconomic rights. Sometimes they define it as gender justice or as disability justice, etc. And I think I feel that's disrespecting the concept. When we discuss other concepts, <coughs> there's no common agreement on what is law. That's why we study it. We look at Dawkins' approach, we look at um, Hart's approach, and there are all the, these various nuanced takes on what is the law and what is the purpose of the law. 
But we never start by saying, nobody knows what law means, because that's dismissive. There are only two things I find in my part of the world that are introduced with that. It is social justice and it is Ubuntu. When we talk about justice, again, justice means different people to different people, if you like. But normally as lawyers, as academics, as scholars, when we define a concept, we start at the source. We would say, when did it first appear? And what was the definition given to it? For example, justice starts getting mentioned around the times of um, Socrates, Aristo uh, uh, Plato, Aristotle. It's all about fairness. And then social justice emerged for the very first time as a concept in around 1843 to 18, around 1843, 1880 to 1843. And it was introduced by an Italian Jesuit scholar, Luigi Tapparelli. So at the very least, we should go with that definition, which was fairness to all. But the fact that he confined it to economic outcomes <coughs> and even spread of economic burdens and economic benefits does not mean he meant that was all. It just means that was the most pressing challenge of his time. And the most, the most pressing challenge of that time was poverty and extreme inequality or unconscionable inequality in the wake of the first industrial revolution, where people had been rooted away from um, subsistence farming and they had to have their sole existence devoted to paying to have a home paying to have food and selling your labor to someone else. And that person saying, they would pay you as little as possible because you have nothing else to do. And that was happening in, in this part of this world. In South Africa, the same thing was happening uh, around exactly that time where um, the locals had been turned into, according to a Stellenbosch professor, Professor Sambito Blanche, they were made to be unfree labor. He, he invents a concept of unfree labor. Again, unfree labor is when you have no option. So it's, it's, it's a certain kind of slavery because you've been dispossessed of land, you've been, you have had taxes imposed on you, you can't have more than a certain number of cows. If you have more than a certain number of cows, your cows would be impounded and you'll be left with nothing. And then obviously, you have no option but to work. It's not, it's not a transaction between equals. So that was around 1840, 1843, social justice was defined by Luigi Tapparelli. And he himself is supposed to have been one of the followers of Thomas Aquino. Those who are into theology would know that it, the church at that stage were Catholic, Catholics believed that a proper society is one where the humanity of everyone is embraced and societal burdens are evenly shared and societal, the benefits of living together are spread evenly and equitably. And um, they claimed that was natural and you'd know those of you who are lawyers, that there are different theories, which I'm going to get to very quickly on, on social justice. The theories uh, uh, of it's a social contract, uh, um, which we call utilitarian theories, like hopes. Um, and then those who uh, felt it is natural. But coming to the natural one, I'm going to get to uh, immediately after the next one. The next time we saw social justice being mentioned was in, um, in, in 1919, it wasn't defined, but you could still see that it was about evenly spreading 
the burdens of collaboration. Because this is, 1919 is the Treaty of Versailles, which followed the First World War, and the feeling was that um, uh, the war came because some were left behind, if I use modern language now, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, and some were uh, shared more of societal burdens and less of, uh, of the benefits of society. And, and of course, one of my colleagues, Prof. Ivan Skailula, who is one of the leaders in the ILO, which was formed uh, under the Treaty of Versailles, to advance social justice in the world, moans, of course, the fact that uh, the Treaty of Versailles was unfair to German workers, and that's why we ended up with the Second World War. Because when the big guys, like they're doing in my part of this world, have a deal that works for big business and works for the political elite, the grass suffers. And of course, you have a recipe. But that was 1919, and then, uh, then we had the, this, after this, after the Soviet Union, it tended, social justice tended to be associated with socialism, even though it was not about socialism, but of course, socialists tended to be more inclined towards socialism. Although, of course, the dictatorship of the proletariat can't be socially just, isn't it? If you, I was a Marxist, but when I look back now, I say, no, it can't be just to have the dictatorship of anybody. <laughs> and a socially just society should have nobody dictating to anybody and should have nobody uh, having a divine right to govern. It should be, democracy should be nothing about us without us and for us all, which is uh, how the Athenians thought about it after studying it in Africa here, according to UNISA studies. 1971, John Rawls told us what justice is and embedded in that. If you look at from page six of A Theory of Justice to page 18, tells us what social justice is. So if you look at when social justice was invented, people say social justice was not part of the deal. Why was that so? It's because traditional societies in many parts of this world tended to take it for granted that between social groups, there must be inequality. If you are a king, there are certain things that you must have that somebody who's not a king must not have. If you are a man, you must have certain things that women can't have, if you're a slave owner, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why, but I've come across authorities that say there was still a social justice element in the times of um, initially we're talking Socrates followed by Plato and then Aristotle, that there were elements of social justice because democracy is anchored in social justice. If you think about the fact, Athenians came with the concept of democracy when they felt that the elites were making all of these decisions for themselves where the burdens were unevenly shared by those who are not represented and the benefits went to the aristocrats. And so they came up with the notion of democracy. Why would you say, because the whole idea of deems was all constituencies were represented, the original, original democracy. All the teams were represented in the lots and, and the, whoever then would pick up the lots and a, every person had an opportunity to govern. That was the original part of democracy, of course, before people like Plato said, I think it was Plato, I keep blaming Plato for everything, but I think it's Plato who said democracy is both a skill and a right, and that's where things then went pear-shaped, that people should only be elected based on their ability. But me and you know that these days they're not elected on the basis of their ability. They're elected on the basis of how much money can they spend to manufacture our consent. 
end. Um, and of course, um, in South Africa with a proportional representation, they just elected if we like the party and everyone goes in. So, but John Rawls is the second person to tell us about social justice, then the Copenhagen Declaration. Then, um, then after that, we, we get to see in South Africa for the first time in 1995, social justice being mentioned in S versus Makwanyane, where in particular, Justice Madala says social justice is a dimension of Ubuntu and a substantive equality. And, and of course, um, although the other justices may not have mentioned the, the, the notion of social justice, but they talk about equality, a substantive equality, which is um, not the same as treating everyone the same. Um, it is about treating everyone differently when necessary. And you get that again in 1995, later after Makwanyane, you then get Justice Musenege giving us a much more a clearer notion of what social justice is. He takes the John, he doesn't talk about John Rawls, but the notion of social justice is both distributive and redistributive. Um, so distributive in that it's about equitable distribution of opportunities, resources, um, benefits, and burdens in a society. But he also says it is also restitutive in that when you have an uneven playing field because of past injustices, you cannot say that justice uh, has now been achieved. And we've tested the the theories of, 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 of social justice. The first one, okay, let me say I've tested the theories of, of, of social justice. The one, which is the, the Rawlsian one, which says it's a natural thing, that humans and apes just want to live in a fair society. And the first time I heard about this was from Bob Geldof at one Young World in Canada to say they tested this with monkeys and then we've since also seen the, the tests that were done by, among others, the Max Planck Institute. They take one monkey, they give it cucumbers for doing the job very well. And monkey is happy because it thinks that this is a fair reward. It, does, it might not like cucumbers. This type of monkey prefers grapes, but it thinks this is life. You get cucumbers for the work until they lift a veil and monkey A sees this monkey B and then monkey B does the same work. They both do the same work now and monkey A, as usual, is expecting cucumbers for rewards. But then he sees monkey B being given grapes, which is his favorite food. So he thinks, oh my goodness, rewards have improved here and he's salivating, expecting grapes and gets, guess what he gets? He gets cucumbers, gets angry and throws away the cucumbers. And these kinds of experiments have been done with different apes all over that there's just that sense that everyone wants to live in a community where your contribution is equitable, and when your rewards uh, from the system are equitable as well. Another video from the Max Planck Institute that also proves that it's a natural thing. Again, there are many theories. I'm just giving you this theory that I gravitate towards. They use children. And I think they're about like four or so. They make them play and then they ask them to pick up their toys. They do the same amount of work. Then when it comes to rewards, the teacher gives one child three pieces of chocolate and gives the other one a whole jar of chocolate. Just check it, you'll find it. on. The, it's called the cost of injustice. And it's, it's the, the 
the faces of those little ones are priceless because both the one who's benefiting unduly and the one who's being cheated look shocked at what just happened. And the teacher asked them, wow, what's happening? And they don't have the language, but you can tell the body language that they don't think it's fair that they should be rewarded uh, inequitably. However, there is an element of social justice that in a world where you had Somerset being a slave owner and, no, Stuart as a slave owner and Somerset as a slave, when you finally say <coughs> to Stuart, you're now free, what happens? Are they now equal? Can they compete equitably? Can the best rise to the top based on their skills? And I think that's the difficulty around social justice because it is a very complex thing. The definition is easy. We, we talk about it's about fairness to all, but at the social justice chair, we say it's about equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms based on case law, um, including Brink versus, Brink versus Keshav, where the words of our own uh, former constitutional court judge uh, Justice um, Kato Reagan uh, are included. But then, then that brings the element that is not included in those cases. Uh, in, the, in the second case with the kids, they ask, what do we do? So the one child, the boy, throws all the sweets back on the floor for, to be distributed equally. But in real life, how do you do that? Uh, how do you reverse things? But do you leave things the same? Uh, Justice Museneke has a verse in Minister of Finance versus Van Heerden that I, I tend to like, but I am going to use this one from Head of Department, Mpumalanga Department of Education and another versus our school MLO, which is high school MLO and another. It's a 2009 case. And so this is where they talk about the tricky thing of how do you level the playing field if you denied others' opportunity. And Justice Mosenega says, apartheid has left us with many scars. The worst of these must be the vast discrepancy in access to public and private resources. The cardinal fault line of our past oppression ran along race, class, and gender. It authorized a hierarchy of privilege and disadvantage. Unequal access to opportunity prevailed in every domain. Access to private or public education was no exception. While much remedial work has been done since the advent of constitutional democracy, sadly, deep social disparities and resultant inequality are with us. It is so that white public schools were hugely better resourced than black schools. When I was working at Verts, it was one rand for every four rand spent on a white child, one rand to a black child. But that was not the, 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 the only thing. It was also the schools were not in, 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 in accessible spaces and they, um, they had been forcibly removed, those communities from certain urban areas. They were lavishly treated by the apartheid government. And so, at the social justice chair at Stellenbosch University, we've tested this theory because most people say equality means we're now equal. We have a new constitution that says we seek to establish a new society that is based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, where everyone's life is improved and everyone's, every citizen's life is improved and everyone's potential is improved. And a lot of people think that means men and women should be treated the same, people with disabilities and those who are not disabled should be treated the same, black people and white people, rural people and urban people should be treated the same. At the social justice chair, working with Professor Sandy Liebenbeck at Stellenbosch University, we, we got students and grown-ups 
well, students are grown-ups and they old, older than 18, but you understand what I mean, you young adults, okay? We got students to play a rigged mon monopoly game. We got one team to wear pink and one team to wear blue, literally. And then we got the blue team to wear shades of blue and the pink team to wear shades of pink. Then we came to class and said, um, you all start playing. It. I discovered that young people do Warcraft and things like that. They don't do Monopoly. So if you don't know, please ask your mom <laughs> or your dad or, or some other ancient person like me. <laughs> so, uh, but it's just a capitalist game. And everyone gets 200 rand or 200 dollars or 200 pounds at the start. And you play a dice, wherever you land, it, it decides your fate. So it's a game of chance to a certain extent. It's partly chance, partly your skill in terms of what you buy, like in a normal life, how, what you buy and how then you use that as rent. Everyone who lends on your property normally starts with houses and garages and things like that. And then eventually you turn your houses to hotel. So they play for about an hour, blue and pink. And then we kick out, we kicked out in this experimental day. We kicked out the pink team. And lawyers can argue about the irrationality of it. Because when they asked me, why are we, uh, are we being kicked out? We said, because you are pink. <laughs> pink does not deserve to be here. And they argue, that's irrational, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then I said, well, I am the government here. I'm the lecturer. I've decided you go off. So they go off for another hour whilst the blue team plays. But here's another additional thing. When they go away, we ask them to leave the properties and the blue teams should take the properties. And because it's a rigged monopoly game, we rig it in that we say the blues <coughs> can also borrow money for the from the bank without interest and they can also exchange um, trade among themselves. It is a rig monopoly game, so it's our, it's our game. And then, after a while, we then ask the pink team to come back. Quite interesting, like in real life, the pink team asks for a reset or compensation, and the blue team said no. And so, I also said no. They played, and you can predict how the game is going to end. Some lucky pink might catch up, to, catch up with some very unlucky blue and coupled with skill. Because the shades of blue and shades of pink are supposed to show that there's no uniform experience in any group in society. When we talk about social justice between groups, people in one group are not the same. And that's why a, a case like uh, Mahlangu versus Minister of Labor in South Africa uh, recognizes intersectionality. And in this case that I've just spoken to you about also recognizes intersectionality. And um, um, Daniels versus Kribante, which is a land case, also recognizes the different levels of inequality. So we then, in this particular case, it was a real immersion. What the students didn't know that we had decided that the winning team was going to get money. So the winning team then obviously was blue, and then we gave them a hundred rand per winner. Which, and then, just like that, those kids' games, uh, some students honestly didn't feel okay with taking them. And we said, it's yours, it was a game. You take your 100 rand. And some students said, no, it's not fair. So me being a bleeding liberal, we messed up the game by then giving the blue ones some money. But it was nice because for a moment they thought they were not going to get money for reasons other than their ability. And this is where the part of social justice that is about restitutive action is uh, spoken by um, some of the justices uh, in the Constitutional Court. And all over the world, really, the Indian Court, I can mention some cases. Um,
that have spoken about restitutive action because the South African constitution is one, is one of about 30 constitutions in the world that specifically mention that, mention that we're building a socially just society. Indian constitution is one of those. The Kenyan constitution is one of those. And then I think the, the question that arises is how do you get there? You want to build a socially just society, but on the ashes of a socially unjust society. Nancy Fraser thinks a socially just society should have representation, recognition, restitution. And if we look at, at South Africa, thank you. If you look at South Africa, inequality persists along the lines of our historical fault lines. And globally, actually, inequality tends to follow historical fault lines whether it's slavery, whether it's those who, who assess or, um, in, in, in feudal systems, etc. Of course, there'll be a few that make it through if that society deliberately uh, focused on building an egalitarian society like the, the, the Nordic countries or the Scandinavian countries. So in, in South Africa, despite this wonderful constitution that has been praised, among others, by Judge Ruth Bader, Beda Ginsberg, we have 55% poverty, which is, has a racial element. Among white people, poverty is at 1%. Among uh, those classified as Indian or Asian, poverty is at 6%. Among those classified as colored or mixed race, poverty is around 41%. Among those classified as African or indigenous Africans, poverty is at 64% within the group 0.1%. The top 10% of, of, of earners in, in the world capture 66% of national income or in, the, in, in South Africa. But globally, they say uh, the wealth of the world, half of the wealth of the world belongs to eight families. The top 10% owns in South Africa 90% of the assets. Black South Africa, South Africans, um, white South Africans own 72% of land, et cetera, et cetera. Let me just say, uh, the, the, the next question is, how do we then build bridges of hope? And I know I was given a, a, an understanding that I should then wrap it up. What we're asking is not to shame anybody. Nobody in this room, not many people anywhere in the world were responsible for the injustices we face in the world. But as our Vice Chancellor, um, Vim de Villiers, often says when we do the social justice work, we are now beneficiaries of those injustices. But we also face the burden of these injustices dividing us, these injustices uh, undermining our ability to rise economically because we have four cylinders, but we're running on only one. Like you have this aeroplane that has four engines, it's only running on one. And so it's our burden now, how do we tackle it? At the Social Justice Chair at Stellenbosch University, we've come up with a Musa plan for social justice. It's like the post-World War plan to rebuild Europe. And we're asking the public to join hands to plug the gap. It doesn't mean we will allow, allow corruption, because corruption is injustice, and state capture is, is even a gross injustice. Uh, so this plan caters for all of that. The first part of it is policies that are tailored for all, because one size fits all policies exacerbate inequalities. We've seen that with gender mainstreaming, those who know about gender mainstreaming. The second part of it is about um, mobilizing social cohesion and social accountability, which is me, you, and everyone else standing up and holding those who exercise public power accountable for their part of the work. So that means we have to understand how constitutions in our different countries work so that we can leverage them. And to the extent that those constitutions are not good enough, don't shout that the constitution is useless. Table, like a young, young Diego, Juan Diego, some uh, young 
child, um, a young person from Panama, just table your own suggestion on what should be changed. Uh, so we're asking you to be the Plato's of our time, Machiavelli's of our time, but just don't do it like Machiavelli. At the end, justifies the means. But I'm just talking the skill, though, of Karl Marx. Again, I'm not saying build utopia power for us, but just give us ideas on how we can turn things around. Because as long as there's injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anyway. And, but I know I'm preaching to the choir because this institution, as I understand it, is founded on social justice. And you already know what I'm talking about. And you are our hope. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Tuli, thank you very much. That was really lovely. Uh, we do have um, a number of people who are online, a number of people in the audience. I do want to uh, move quickly uh, to questions and reflections from the audience. I do want to say one thing, however. It seems to me that there's two messages in what you say. The one is that if we, that social justice is fundamental to our sustainable future. And if you are thinking about social justice, what you're, not, what you're talking about is both the equitable distribution of burdens and benefits of a society, but also the restitutive initiatives that would enable that to, to, be, to happen. But the second thing you're saying is that there's bridges of hope. And it seems to me that what you're saying is that if you're talking about bridges of hope, you're talking about creating a vision that can appeal to multiple sectors of society as part of a collective project of inclusion. Now, South Africa is the great example of this, if you like. Um, and Nelson Mandela is the great exam example of it. But it seems to me that if you go to South Africa today, many young people will be critical of, of Nelson Mandela. Because the argument will be that what, what has happened with that bridges of hope in South Africa is that we've consolidated the very inequalities we were meant to address. And we are far more unequal society in many ways than what people, uh, than people feel. They feel that the 1994 prospect has been betrayed. And that has created an anger uh, and, and, a, and a rebellion, if you like. And I, it seems to me that that's the hidden question that needs to remain. So I want you to just note that because I'm sure you want to respond to that. And I want to open up to the, to the, the, the audience to see if they have others. I'll take rounds of three. I should say one thing before, uh, before we end because I'm sure somebody's going to raise it. So I want to clarify this. Uh, SOAS was founded not on a social justice vision. I want to be clear. It was founded as a place to train colonial administrators for the colonies. Hopefully, over the last 100 years, we've shifted some of that vision, uh, and, and we are trying to address that. Uh, and I do think that, that the audience that is uh, uh, in, in SOAS today, in many ways, uh, at least especially its students, do reflect and advance the social justice agenda. <laughs> but we are born as, a, as an institution that was meant to advance the colonial project. And I, I, I do want to clarify that up front. Uh, uh, and I do think it's a history that we want, to, we want to unravel. So with that, let me see some hands. I know we've got hands coming from there. Are there any? Let's start, on, let's start with the question from, the, from online, and then I can come here because I can see people here. Okay, so I might read out um, three questions that have come in online, because then you might be able to address, uh, address the, the, these questions. So um, we've got a question about um, how best to address social justice in education. Um, there's also a question about um, giving examples of good results that you might have seen from the approach to social change that you've recommended. Um, and um, there's a, also a question about um, 
understanding um, the role of the state. How can we see the state, state's role um, in terms of its promotion of rights and respect for citizens' access to um, their socioeconomic rights um, when there's lots of disillusionment with states in, in the world at the moment? Okay. And then I just want to take two years. So there's a young woman right there with the white jacket. And then the person right in front of you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for such a fascinating lecture. My name is Samia Bano. I'm a lawyer and a legal academic in the School of Law. Um, I really enjoyed your lecture, um, but I wanted to play the devil's advocate and say one of the problems with social justice is, or, or the outcomes of social justice is law, right? Are we putting too much hope in law? And also that the underpinnings, um, you talked about John Rawls and Bentham and others, the liberal principles of fairness and justice never have played out in a level playing field. So that there, there is a very important critical legal critique that you will never find uh, socially just outcomes as long as liberal law operates the way it does. Right. Um, and secondly, I just wondered what your insights or your thoughts were about Chile and the Constitution, that actually it has been overwhelmingly rejected when it's one of the most progressive um, constitutions. So again, it raises the question that are we putting too much hope into law? And that's the problem. Can the person in front of you? Um, good evening. My name is Ankit. And, um, I am second generation SOAS. My father had his LLM here 38 years ago, and um, I am testament to the fact that the university has gone leaps and bounds. But um, while preparing to come to SOAS, I read about Thiruval Lair, who has a famous quote. He said, the walls of peace are built in the on the roof of understanding. And Professor, to you, my question is, under the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1514, which, which spurs from the South African cases in the International Court of Justice, do you as an advocate see any utility and viability in international law today? And perhaps if I have to give a context, we can look at the case of the British Empire's last African colony and the case of Chagos. And, Perhaps it's true, as, as, as Professor said, it is Bentham who came up with the word international law after all. So is there any utility in law in the 21st century? Thank you. Can I come back to you? Yes. Thank you for those marvelous questions. That's one of the reasons I came back to, uh, to academia, because I knew that this is where the Marxes, Benthams, Hobbes, etc., of our time are lying. Just to the question about some young people rejecting Mandela, a lot of it has to do with rejecting the South African Constitution, where they say it's a liberal constitution. But those people who reject the Constitution have not read constitutional court judgments. Check government decision making in South Africa against constitutional court decision making in South Africa. There's a running theme in the Constitution where ultimately they ask the question, is this just and equitable? And yet, when laws are made, that question is not always asked. That's why we've come up with something called the Social Justice Impact Assessment Matrix. And we're working on a social justice explorer using gaming to inculcate a culture of tailoring law for all. Because you always have to ask yourself, will this work for older persons? Or will it push them further? away from opportunity and more into the block, black hole of um, burdens? Will it work for, social, for, for domestic workers, rural people, etc.? And I, I think that, I'm not saying that the, the judges ask the questions all the time. One of my gripes is a case called uh, NEF versus the pub protector 
where I thought a, a, Zimbabwean, a former Zimbabwean woman was treated deplorably <laughs> by being sent from pillar to post <coughs> and then eventually being told, oh, you don't qualify under the black um, empowerment laws because you were not black by April 27, 1994, which is a given, but you can't send her on a run around over a period of three years and then come back and say, oh, I was sending you to get this, that, and that because I just failed to do my job to find out, do you qualify, etc." And then it went to a judge and the judge decided I was irrational by asking government to act properly. So I'm not suggesting that uh, the law always acts right. Um, I do think, though, that the law has enormous potential for social change. The Somerset case that I quoted earlier did make a difference to Somerset. And the judge knew that there would be implications. In fact, there's even arguments that the Somerset case somehow triggered the anti-slavery thing. Because the decision here was that in England, uh, there was no law authorizing slavery. And um, the, the court then said, slavery is so odious, so lawyers, that's a judge teaching people because it's embedded in your head. It's so odious that the only way we can allow it to happen is if there's positive law that introduces it. So meaning law can change. Coming from South Africa, I know that even in the darkest days of apartheid, administrative law was one of the areas where some inroads were, were um, we created to push back against the excesses of apartheid. And there was even one case when the whole concept of judicial scrutiny was introduced for the first time in South Africa in um, the, the Hoffman case. And the judges said, um, this has not complied with the, the, the clauses that had allowed South Africa from, this is decolonization, well, semi-decolonization, where South Africa was still a semi-colony, but was now the Union of South Africa. And it had to comply with certain requirements, uh, constitutional requirements, and it hadn't. So that's a judge using whatever is available, but at the end of it, they're just trying to ensure justice. It was the same as Lord Somerset. I'm certain, I mean, um, the, um, not, not Lord Somerset, in the Somerset case, it's the same, that the judge was just finding a way within the law to ensure justice. And, and therefore, I do think that if we have lawyers that have been trained in respecting justice and not sacrificing law at the altar, sacrificing justice at the altar of justice, we can do better. And what is the guardrail that can assist lawyers to lean towards justice as opposed to law? It is the constitution, if you have a constitution like South Africa, Kenya, or India, or it is international instruments as the one you've cited, so, where again, if I look at, um, I think, uh, justice, Reagan, f forgive me if I'm wrong, but when the court had to find that the state has a duty to prevent gender-based violence or just to, pre to prevent violence, there wasn't a verbatim <coughs> statute that says you have a duty to prevent violence. There was no, the Constitution didn't say that. The court used CEDO, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So it takes judges that understand that ultimately everyone deserves to live in a just society. And you as a judge have a duty, of course, within the principles of the law to advance justice. But I do know that in, in our country, again, there is a tendency to respect the common law 
a little bit more than um, it should be respected, even when it is um, <laughs> it is against the rules. And then, um, say you're asking, how do we how do how do you address justice in education? The starting point is the law, and we we've come up with this. A instrument that is called the Social Justice Impact Assessment Matrix, which will make sure that when they design laws, they have to think about will they do the things that Prof. Adam Habib spoke about. And it's two tests, really. One, will this exacerbate existing inequalities? The second one, will this reduce existing inequalities? And by adding the second test, we are building in, in the case of South Africa, we are building in um, Minister of Finance versus Van Kieren, et cetera. But globally, you're building in CEDO, because it does require positive measures. You're, you, you're building in SED, Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The ICPD, the International a, a convention on the rights of people with disabilities, the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and then of course regional instruments such as the EU, etc. So you can make a difference, but you need conscious justice. And um, lastly, yeah, I think I've answered the question that law is like any other thing. It can be weapon of destruction, it can be a shield, it can be a sword that advances justice. In the right hands, it can do a lot of good. In South Africa, we've seen the law achieve much devastation under the Black Administration Act and many acts. You can see that in the book from uh, Sampi Templage. But in my lifetime, I've also seen the law being used to create bridges of hope. Thank you.